South Wales. Now, through Wednesday evening, we'll see clear spells remain for the vast majority. But again, some thicker cloud for Western and Northern Scotland. Some outbreaks of light rain and drizzle here. Northern Ireland also largely cloudy, but it's a warm night in places, a muggy night for some. 16 Celsius for Southampton, London, and I think mid-teens for Scotland and Northern Ireland. Now, for Scotland, once again, Western areas seeing the cloud and those outbreaks of light rain during Thursday. But further south, plenty of sunshine before some heavy showers start to emerge in the far south by the afternoon. Showers develop more widely on Friday, along with much cooler air. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV, on radio, on digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices. With honest and civilised conversation. We're not part of the establishment. We're one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News, the people's channel. Britain's news channel. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. Join us for Ministry of Offence, the comedy panel show that's just like the news, in that the left fights the right and it doesn't really seem to matter who wins. We cover the big stories. It was in fact a troop of baboons and not angry vegans. I like that. And the really important stories. Fat naked cow gets stuck in swimming pool. It's a headline in a lot of local newspapers. <laughs> yeah. We're on the same team, Nick. Yeah, but I'm just helping you. Join us for Ministry of Offence, Saturday nights, 8 o'clock on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello there, it's six o'clock. I'm Michelle Jubry, and this is Jubes and Kerr, the show where we'll get into some of the things that have got you talking today. Now, day one of the strikes. We've had a massive build up to this, haven't we? So, first and foremost, I'm wondering have these strikes affected you today? When it comes to the government, many people are coming out and criticising the government, saying, that they're not doing enough and that they should have absolutely been more involved in the talks. Grant Shapps, however, says no. That is just demanding, so it's a stunt by the unions, is it? And what about Labour, the party pretty much, some might say, formed by the uh, trade unions, Keir Starmer, has said that his front benchers should not attend the pickets. Got to say, though, some of them have not paid any attention to that whatsoever. But where do you think... Uh, when it comes to Keir Starmer, do you think that he was right to do that or not? And moving on, how much do you think a criminal past should affect your future, particularly when it comes to your job prospects? And I can't help but notice Ben Stiller is the latest celebrity to pay a visit to Ukraine to meet President Zelensky. Is this really what we need at a time of crisis? Celebrity visits? Yes or no, you tell me. And get this over in Japan. A new dating scheme has launched. Never mind apps and technology, no. This one is all about the humble art of letter writing. If you want to meet your match, apparently, that is what you need to be doing. Have you ever written a love letter? Is that your thing? Gotta say, not for me. Anyway, I'll have all that to come, but first, the latest news headlines.
Thanks, Michelle. It's two minutes past six. I'm Bethany Elsie in the GB Newsroom. Major travel disruption for passengers across the UK as 80% of train services are cancelled in the largest strike action in nearly three decades. The Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, warned commuters they must stay the course in the face of what he's calling unnecessary aggravation. More walkouts are planned for Thursday and Saturday, but the knock-on effects will be felt all week. It's after last-minute talks failed to resolve a dispute between unions and rail bosses over pay, jobs and conditions. We need the union barons to sit down uh, with Network, Network Rail and the train companies and, and get on with it. And uh, we need, I'm afraid, everybody, and I say this to the, to the country as a whole, uh, we need to get ready to, to stay the course. The RMT Union General Secretary described today's turnout as fantastic and said it exceeded expectations. Mick Lynch said the union members will continue to campaign until their demands are met. This is a lawful dispute under the legislation that the Tories brought in themselves. And every time we meet the hurdles and uh, break the thresholds that they brought in, they want to change the law again. We've got the most draconian laws in Western Europe and in, and in any democracy, in fact, anti-trade union laws. Whatever they bring in, we'll meet that challenge and we'll continue to campaign and, if necessary, we'll take effective industrial action when we need to. Some unions have reacted with fury over a leaked memo which suggests Labour has banned its front benches from picket lines. The head of the TSSA union described it as ridiculous nonsense by a party that was created by trade unions. Labour has declined to comment, although some MPs have joined demonstrations, including Scottish Labour leader Anna Sawa, who met workers striking in Edinburgh. Meanwhile, Royal Mail says it will ballot more than 115,000 of its workers over potential industrial action. The Communication Workers' Union is demanding an inflation-based pay increase. The union described the 2% pay offer as totally inadequate. Ballot papers will be sent out to members next week and the results will be released next month. In other news, a man who murdered a couple in their home while their children slept upstairs has been jailed for life with a minimum term of 38 years. Stephen and Jennifer Chapel were both stabbed six times in November last year in Norton Fitzwarren near Taunton. Colin Reeves, who served in Afghanistan, launched the attack after a long-running dispute over parking. He killed the couple using a ceremonial dagger which was given to him when he left the army. Meanwhile, in West London, a fire at a residential high-rise building in Shepherd's Bush, close to Grenfell Tower, is thought to have been started by someone charging an electric scooter in their flat. The blaze is now under control. One person was taken to hospital, suffering with smoke inhalation. 30 residents were evacuated from the building. And a police investigation is underway after the death of a woman and child in Barnet in North London. Officers were called to a property by the ambulance service earlier today. They found a 37-year-old woman and a 5-year-old, believed to be her daughter, with stab wounds. Both were pronounced dead at the scene. A 37-year-old man has been arrested on suspicion of murder. The average annual grocery bill could jump by £380 this year as food price inflation hits a 13-year high. The latest data from Kantar says that's an increase of more than £100 since April. Shoppers could be spending £32 more every month in the supermarket. And crowds have returned to Stonehenge to mark the summer solstice for the first time in two years. The sun rose over the stones at around 10 to 5 this morning and won't set until almost 9.30 this evening, giving more than 16 and a half hours of daylight. The summer solstice has been celebrated at Stonehenge for thousands of years, with the stones framing the sun as it rises. This is TV Online and DAB Plus Radio. This is GB News. Now, let's get back to Michelle. Thanks for that, Bethany. Um, you know the drill on Jubes and Co, don't you, by now? I want to know what is on your mind. Joining me tonight, keeping me company, we've got the economist, Jeevan Sander. Hello, I'm excited to talk to you, not least because 
Um, I've had the sentence, wage price spiral, so much today. So I want your thoughts on that. Dominic Samuels also, good evening to you. James Woodhausen, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you this. James Woodhausen has got his legs out. I've had to look at your legs today. In fact, I still have to look at your legs. I don't know who's campaigning. I'm sure there's a campaign somewhere for people not to wear shorts to the office. Talk to my agent. I, I want to sign that petition, wherever that petition is. Uh, I, I voluntarily add my signature to it. That's what I say. Um, you know the drill on Jubes and Co as well, don't you? It's not just about us three here. It's about you at home as well. What's on your mind tonight? Get in touch. GBviews at gbnews.uk is the email. Or you can tweet me at gbnews. Don't forget, if you haven't already, you can subscribe to our YouTube um, we've got an app, we're on the radio, we are absolutely everywhere. So wherever you are tonight joining me, you are very, very welcome. Oh, blimey, that was a bit dramatic, wasn't it? That, uh, it. I wasn't <laughs> expecting that little uh, dramatic moment there, that pause. But wow, yes, as that just alluded to, it is the strike day one today. First and foremost, have you been affected by this? There's been a massive build-up to it, hasn't there? Um, has it been as dramatic and as impactful, do you think, um, as the unions would have wanted and hoped for? Or have you just been basically chilling out in your back garden, enjoying the sun, saying thank you very much to the unions? Uh, I wish I was at home in the sun, but no, we have you to entertain and to inform. So here we are. We've made it into the office. It didn't affect me that much, I've got to say. That's why I want to know, did it affect you today? Right, uh, we've got a reporter, Will Hollis, over at one of the train stations for us. Where are you? Hello, yeah, we're at Nottingham train station right now where there is a bit of a picket line. There are RMT uh, staff or certainly supporters who are here outside the train station. It's a really bright sky at the moment, as you can see from my face. So people are moving around, uh, they're enjoying the sun, but it is decisively a lot less quieter than it would usually be, obviously. This is rush hour here in Nottingham. Lots of people getting on trains to leave the city. Maybe they were going back down to London or to one of the, uh, one of the other cities, Leicester or Derby, where a lot of people were work from this part of the, this part of the East Midlands. Of course, only one train per hour was running to those destinations. East Midlands Rail, like most of the rail services, were running a severely reduced timetable, but that's for places like Nottingham, that's for those big cities. But if you're from Nottinghamshire or Derbyshire, where the only way for you to get around was in fact a train. Today would have been a day where you went to the buses or the coaches, where National Express say they tried to put on extra services, but they simply, simply couldn't cope with the demand uh, expressed by people that would usually be served by the rail service. National Express said they uh, sold out about 85% of their services for the entire week, all the way um, throughout this week, uh, as, as early as yesterday. So, of course, people still need to get around, people still uh, going to and from the station, but in much smaller numbers than they will have been seeing last week. And, of course, this is going on on a couple of days. Uh, it's Thursday and Saturday that strike action happens, but the effects are going to be felt on the days in between and for uh, a little bit longer as well, we can expect. Well, thank you very much for that update. And I love the sun where you are. It looks absolutely glorious. You have yourself a good evening, whatever you're going to be up to after work. Right, let's talk to my panel. Um, in fact, actually, I'll mention Martin. Martin, you've been one of my first emails in tonight, and I think you make a very good point because there's been lots of toing and froing today. There's been a huge blame game happening, hasn't there, uh, about whose fault this is. Is the government doing enough? And what are Labour Party doing, etc., etc.? Martin says, Michelle, uh, how come no-one's made this very good point, he says? Um, why are all of these talks conducted on camera? public screened, live screened, and then that way everyone can make up their own minds as to who's to blame and who is not to blame. Um, Jeevan, I think I'll start with you on this one. Uh, I don't want to oversimplify it because it's not just about pay, albeit pay is a big part of it. I'm hearing lots and lots uh, about wage price spirals and everyone be careful, you can't be paid too much money or else you're going to send everything into free fall, uh, say all of these MPs, MPs having just accepted their own pay rise themselves. Where do you stand on it? <laughs> well, in terms of the wage price spiral, no, it's incorrect. So they, what would happen usually in a wage price spiral is that kind of workers would keep bidding up their wage and that would lead to inflation becoming kind of embedded in the economy. But we are seeing actually the Bank of England is acting to reduce inflation. So we're seeing that people actually are expecting the Bank of England to bring down prices. We have seen it. Do you mean with their interest rate rises? With interest rate rise, yes, mostly. A little bit of quantitative easing decline, but not enough. But certainly with those interest rate 
rises. The thing that happens then is people go, OK, the Bank of England is going to get inflation under control. And we accept that actually this kind of what's caused this point of inflation, the war in Ukraine, supply chain disruption, actually sort of temporarily go away. But the uh, Bank of England is acting to do so. On the other side of it, yes, of course, rail workers pay, as you mentioned, but also, of course, 2,000 job losses and also worried about safety upon the line. Can you just help the viewers understand people that don't have an economic background? Mm -hmm. uh, there's often talk about the Bank of England, they're going to put up the interest rates, that's going to help everything. Mm -hmm. Just explain the correlation between uh, Bank of England putting up the base rates and somehow how that's going to resolve inflation for people. So the Bank of England, when it's putting up the base rate, is basically making money more expensive and it's reducing the amount of money that's being kind of supplied into the economy. Think about the other way around. If the Bank of England printed loads of cash, when there's low unemployment, you'd expect to see prices rise because output stayed the same, the same amount of goods are being produced, but now you've got a lot more money. What are the Bank of England taking in the other direction? So making less money being created. So when there's less money being created, then actually it kind of puts down kind of a lid on those price rises. Yeah, by the way, when it comes to interest rates, I always find it uh, amusing, although amusing is probably not the right word, but fascinating how quick uh, some of these companies are. You put your base rate up, you seconds later get a text message from your mortgage provider saying, just to let you know, the Bank of England has put the base rate up so your mortgage is going up. And I sit and still wait for my text message from the same bank telling me that they're going to put the interest rate up on my savings account. I never get one of those. But anyway, I digress from the strikes, okay. bringing it back to the strikes. That was my little rant there about the bank's practice. <laughs> uh, Dominique, where do you stand on this whole kind of striking situation today? I think just on, on your point about the Bank of England wanting to um, get inflation under control, um, if you offset with what rail bosses are actually asking for, which is a 7% pay increase, do you think that that will inevitably have some effect on prices, regardless of whether or not you know the Bank of England is trying to get inflation under control? Because, I mean... The Bank of England really has been woeful on inflation. These Quite months, right. And a lot of people have criticised them a lot over it. So can people actually trust the Bank of England to get inflation under control, especially when, on the back of that, you've got numerous public sector workers demanding extremely high um, pay rises? So first and foremost, the Bank of England was a bit late and acted a bit late and didn't get on top of this inflation problem early enough. I wish they'd acted quicker, but this is where we are. And they are certainly are moving towards that direction. In terms of will this lead to kind of embedded price rises? No, not really. This is wages catching up with where prices are about to go and have gone already. In terms of where public sector works are, why they are demanding higher pay rises, because in the decade leading up to this moment, since 2010, they saw an average pay cut of £1,600. In the year ahead, they're facing another pay cut of £3,000. Nurses, a pay cut of £2,000. By the way, it's why we had 40,000 nurses, vacancies up to the pandemic, and why now we're having nurses visiting food banks, of course. That's obviously terrible, but in comparison to the rest of the workers across the economy, public sector workers comparatively have had it a lot better than a lot more people. Um, the um, rail workers already were offered um, a 2% pay rise by Network Rail. And you have to forget, you have to remember that the government paid literally billions in order to keep um, the rail services afloat, despite the fact that there is decreased demand for train services. Now we're at a point where less people are using the railways. I think usage has gone down by about a quarter. And from my perspective, what the government is saying is that you need to be a tad more economic with um, a few of your staffing choices. With regards to um, agency staff, Grant Shapps was on um, GMB this morning. And he said, with regards to agency staff, what would actually happen is that you would have one person that can do a range of other jobs, employ that one person, rather than having two, two separate people that essentially have the same skills, but do two separate jobs, the same job. For me personally, I don't see what is unreasonable about that. So I think let's take those things in turn. First and foremost, I want to. Can we preview though? Because I also want to bring James in. Yeah, first of, sorry, it's just. Yeah. First and foremost, <laughs> private sector workers, I want to see every worker in this country earn enough to put food on the table and pay their energy bills. That's the first thing but they're to say. Guys Secondly, by the of course, now, the train companies, of course, train companies have, or rather, train workers or pay freezes throughout the pandemic. And that's why, of course, they've already taken a hit and now they're about to take another hit. And I think if any of us were in a situation where we couldn't put 
food on the table, actually, we would definitely want pay rises to keep up with inflation. But in terms of agency workers, in terms of agency workers, in terms of agency workers in this country, I think it's very difficult to expect that to happen, given how low unemployment worker unemployment is. There's not a whole range of extra agency workers waiting to do all these jobs in the train companies. I certainly couldn't do it. I'm sure no one on this table could easily replace them. Right, let me bring in um, James Woodhouse. And I have to say, by the way, uh, dear viewers and listeners, if you've heard a whole raft of banging, clattering and deep breathing, James is responsible. <laughs> oh my what God, have you been doing? You're dropping your microphone <laughs> and goodness gracious me. And did you tell me you had to run to get here? So the strike's absolutely affected you. Absolutely. That is not good. Uh, no, I support me. the strike. Do you? Even though you had to jog to get yourself in here, that is dedication yeah. to the cause. Yeah, yeah. So you're in support of the strikes. Yeah. On what basis is it? Do you are you kind of in the realm of you think they need to be paid more, or what is your support based on? Well, as colleagues have said, it's not just about pay; it's also about pensions, and there's a, a one third reduction, I believe, coming in them uh, for train workers. Um, I put it to you, Michelle, that uh, it is not just um, Ukraine or supply chain difficulties that's brought about inflation. It's falling profitability, a need to raise margins, a need for every firm that is buying more expensive goods to increase prices. Uh, and therefore, when workers find that uh, they are confronted with an inability to put food on the table, why on earth shouldn't they go on strike? Why shouldn't they do that? Are they all what the Evening Standard calls them, the RMT variant? They're like a virus. That's what it said in today's paper in London. They're not a virus. We all know that they're so selfish. We've suddenly discovered overnight that train drivers and rail workers are totally selfish and so on. We've got to rally behind Boris and, you know, really beat them down a la Thatcher 40 years ago. We're not no. in the same place, though, surely. And, I mean, even... Um... Former Home Secretary David Blunkett, he wrote an article for the Mail, um, I think it was today, actually. Um, he himself said that, you know, he's a proud, you know, trade union member, proud supporter <laughs> of unions. Um, however, to compare the situation we're in today to that of the 1970s, which is, he says, RMT bosses are actually doing, he thinks it's woefully inaccurate. And actually, they're doing a disservice... Well, he may, he may be right, but he may be right, if I may himself. finish what I was saying, he may be right, but what strikes me uh, is the sort of warmed-up Thatcherite rhetoric that hapless Grant Shapps, uh, the defender of the workers, uh, is forced into. And, you know, he's 40 years out of date. Of course, this isn't the 70s. Quite different. We've got China, we have Ukraine and all of that. Pardon but me? these Pavlovian reactions of uh, these warmed-up Thatcherites do no justice to the train system, the train management, which is shocking. You, you know, even if the workers are not on strike, you can't get a train that's on time and is empty in the north in this country. Right? Don't tell me the workers are responsible for that. And don't tell me that MPs who voted themselves that pay increase uh, did so on the basis of higher productivity, more mechanisation, uh, MP-free parliament and so on, you know, because it's all automated. They didn't. They rewarded themselves, just like Andrew Bailey and all those people at the Bank of England Monetary Policy Committee. Andrew Bailey wasn't just a little bit late clamping down on inflation with interest rates. He was a year late, maybe 18 months late, and his conduct at the Financial Conduct uh, authority was equally unprofessional and rubbish. He should have gone a long time ago. The government should control interest rates, not people we don't uh, elect. Who, who elected Andrew Bailey? No, but he's in charge of all of the stuff that's so important to workers' I pay. I thought the government did used to do um, interest rates and then it went out to the Bank of England. Is that's that right. right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. And which one, which one Gordon was Gordon Brown. I, in my view, actually, you would have an independent monetary policy committee. The temptation for a government is they come to an election, they go, right, we're going to cut so, interest yeah. rates at least to a bit more growth than inflation comes out afterwards. So the fair, electorate should policy. take second place to an unelected idiot like Andrew Bailey. Is I that believe, what you're saying? I believe the monetary policy could be takes monetary policy out of the hands of politicians who may use <sighs> it in order to kind of win an election and also does so. And in the decade leading up to this moment, for the past 20 years, certainly inflation was incredibly low. Like, we can't fault that until this particular point in time we did have low and stable inflation. Elephant in the room, lockdowns. <laughs> well, yeah, and I do actually think, I was discussing this yesterday, Dominique, a lot of people um, were really wanting kind of harder, longer, deeper, exactly. more drawn out um, lockdowns. 
And there is no such free uh, thing as a free lunch. So when we've had all this furlough, we've had all these lockdowns, there are consequences to and all of this saying? stuff. What were people saying? Are you sure you want these lockdowns? Because you do know that the consequences will be economic turmoil. And we were told to just shut up. You know, old people are dying, get on with it, without actually discussing with people what the consequences would be. The government paid billions of pounds for rail workers to keep their jobs throughout the pandemic, which I think was fair. However, now that has to be paid for. And unfortunately, with less people using the rails, I don't think it makes much sense to keep the same level of staff. And actually, these strikes sort of help the government in a way, because now um, workers are actually going on strike. They can actually push through um, the legislation with the William Sharp's um, proposals for rail that they originally wanted in the first place. Agency workers, and actually, otherwise known as and, staff. And, and, and actually, and actually um, the, the strike breakers. voluntary um, redundancies as well. So that's people who want to leave the sector um, doing it voluntarily. And actually, they've had, uh, I think, about 5,000 applications, more than actually expected. So people are voluntarily leaving the sector as well, including um, rail managers. But hang on, how is an agency worker, a scab in your words, they're not part of an organisation that's striking, they're not breaking their own picket line, they're someone that's been brought in to create some kind of skeleton service. So I'm interested in your, why you would call those people scabs. Well, it's got, uh, you know, a, somebody, somebody who tries to stop strikers, wherever they come from, whether they're part of the workforce or whether they're hired or they're goons, which is what happened at Grumwick's 40 years ago, where I was demonstrating in favour of the Grumwick workers. Well, well, when you get that, it's called a scab. It's called a strike breaker. It doesn't That's matter where they really came from. Derogatory. Yes, it is derogatory. Are you, you send a socialist? Them to, yeah, you send them to Coventry. Yes, I'm a socialist. Oh, wow. <gasps> Imagine that. You know, oh, it's I so just, terrible. Yeah, no, I just it's think so it, I just think it's interesting that you're sort of evoking these really quite nasty Workers Unite sentiments towards people that just really... Well, wait a minute. You said, that the, you, you said that the, you know, the, quite rightly, that in the lockdown we were all supposed to do what we're told. What's different between... Wait lockdowns. a minute. What's different between the government telling us, you know, uh, do this, do that, you're, uh, you know, we don't care if you die, and then telling the workers, oh, you're suddenly so selfish, you know, you're the reason that everything's so bad on the trains and so on. It's completely uh, inconsistent. It is inconsistent, and that's why I don't really support these strikes, but I also didn't support the government micromanaging our everyday lives and stopping ordinary people going out and earning a living. I think that's intellectually... Let me just bring some of the viewers in. Rob on the email says, I agree with Boris. This dispute is about job security, not pay. A job for life is a myth now, and modernisation cannot happen until that myth is challenged. We risk ending up like France if public transport unions are appeased. That's Rob. Dawn says, without trade unions, employees would not have working rights, maternity, paternity rights, health and safety... Uh, collective bargaining, etc. Dawn says we should absolutely be behind the unionists who are prepared to fight for better pay and terms for all of us, so solidarity to them. Many of you getting in touch with me and just saying um, yes or no in terms of whether or not you support the strikes. Let me know your reasons why. Uh, Norma, you say all of your family are very, 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 your words, not mine, opposed to the strikes. I'm fascinated. Tell me your reasons why. Mike raises a good uh, point to you, Jeevan. Uh, he's saying, can I ask the economist on the panel a simple question? Mm -hmm. uh, when you're all supporting or when everyone's saying keep pay in terms, uh, you know, in real terms in terms of inflation, mm -hmm. so increase, 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 increase because of inflation, some of the reasons that we're having this inflation are temporary reasons. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about supply and demand, particularly on fuel off the back of Ukraine, some would say that's temporary and therefore that will correct itself in time. So what he's asking is, if you give all these inflationary pay rises and then things settle, would you then support pay decreases to reflect the settlement? Would that settlement even happen, by the way? Do you think prices would uh, drop down or is that it now once you've had inflation? So, yeah, we should remember that like, inflation is an increase in the price of from here to here. So the price level will be higher, but the increase can still fall. So in one sense, I'd expect like, a higher pay settlement this year and then when inflation falls again down to 2%, then actually the inflation or rather wage settlement to kind of follow that back down. But what about the pri what about the cost of living? So let's just say mm -hmm. for arguments, because if, if, infl if inflation is the difference between A to B, mm -hmm. and your price point is, I don't know, let's just say fuel currently costs £10. Just bear with me, viewers and listeners. I'm trying to simplify mm -hmm. something. 
so let's just say if something costs ten pound, yep. it used to cost eight pound, and we're all saying right, give a pay rise because now it's a ten pound. Mm -hmm. If the ten pound suddenly goes back down to an eight pound, I think this is the point that Mike's trying to oh, make. Okay. Should that wage, because everyone's just got a, a wage increase to get to £10, should it be reduced then? Yeah, so in that case, like, inflation is just very, very rarely negative. Um, and what it is is when something's gone really badly wrong. So in the 2008 financial crisis, when inflation pulled out to no than 0%. In the main and in the round, generally speaking, inflation's uh, very rarely below zero. Something's gone very badly wrong. Well, there you go, Mike. Did that answer your question? Let me know. By the way, of course, um, the strikes are not over at the end of today. Uh, they will continue, potentially, if things are not fixed. And they will be much broader as well, because you're going to be seeing other unions uh, and other different companies stepping up as well. Uh, right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, I'll have more of your reaction to that uh, story. But also, I want to ask you, when it comes to people's criminal past, do you think that we should be a bit more forgiving? And how much should a criminal prosecution from your past affect your future prospects, particularly when it comes to things like employment? We'll have that in just a couple of minutes. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV, on radio, on digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices. With honest and civilised conversation. We're not part of the establishment. We're one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News, the people's channel. Britain's news channel. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> Whether you're with us on TV, radio or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6am. Hope you can join us. Join us for Ministry of Offence, the comedy panel show that's just like the news, and the left fights the right and it doesn't really seem to matter who wins. We cover the big stories. It was in fact a troop of baboons and not angry vegans. I like that. And the really important stories. Fat naked cow gets stuck in swimming pool. It's a headline in a lot of local newspapers. <laughs> yeah. We're on the same team, Nick. Yeah, but I'm just helping you. Join us for Ministry of Offence, Saturday nights, 8 o'clock on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Coming up on The Mark Stein Show. As a harrowing report on child exploitation is published in Oldham, Conservative woman writer Laura Perrins will be asking how a grooming gang boss got a job as a council welfare rights officer. Emmanuel Macron suffers parliamentary election defeat and faces political paralysis. The Telegraph's Anne Elizabeth Moutet will be on hand to unpick the president's peril. Plus, Natalie Winters is back to explain why the Wuhan lab leak theory is gaining far more credibility. All that and more on The Mark Stein Show tonight from 8 o'clock. Hello there, welcome back to Jubes & Co with me, Michelle Jubery. A quick reminder as to who's keeping me company on the panel tonight, in case you missed it at the start, writer and broadcaster Dominique Samuels, the economist Jeevan Sander and Professor James Woodhausen. Uh, welcome to all of you. Now, Michael says, I'm a HGV driver and I was expecting outrageous road tailbacks, he says. Um, but in his mind, the roads have been emptier because people seem to have taken the day off instead of facing up to the hassle. Um, Paul says, well, the traffic is always rubbish in Wigan due to the council being useless. <laughs> <laughs> the strike oh. has made no difference whatsoever, Paul says. Uh, well, I don't know. You tell me about Wigan Council. Um, no idea, but apparently the traffic there was not good today. That's according to Paul. Uh, Joe says, Michelle, I'm not surprised the strikes didn't affect you today because I bet you were chauffeur driven into work. I wasn't actually, Joe. I was going to come in um, on a scooter, but my battery was dead, so I couldn't do that. Then I was going to get 
uh, a higher bike and I couldn't get one of those either. So I didn't have a great time. And no, I didn't have a chauffeur. I should probably negotiate my pay in terms, though, to make sure I get one in my... <laughs> so selfish. <laughs> what? And by the way, just before I went to the break, I'm moving on in a second to criminal records, but before I do, I was saying I was quite surprised by Labour's uh, Keir Starmer's response, should I say, to the strikes today. What did you make to Keir Starmer? He was basically saying to his front benches, don't get onto the picket lines. Was that right in your mind, James? Well, it's what we've come to expect from Labour. You know, it's important to realise, on a historical note, that Labour was not formed by trade union members more than 100 years ago. It was formed by the trade union bureaucracy, and it was always in alliance, and wants to be in an alliance now, with the Liberals, or the Liberal Democrats now. So the fact that Starmer won't back the strikes uh, is no surprise to me or anybody who studied the history of the Labour Party. If they have some outliers who occasionally decide that the RMT, which voted for Brexit, is not racist after all, but actually worth supporting, well, then Angela and Arena and all the others can go and do that. But it doesn't prevent the fact that David Blunkett and everybody else very hostile to the strike and to workers generally. Very quickly, just a brief point to both of you, if you've got one. Uh, what did you think to Labour's response to it? I wasn't surprised at all. Kiss Dumber wants to win the next election, and that's exactly what he's focused on. Um, I, I was surprised, actually. I think <laughs> what surprised me the most was that um, the memo itself was leaked to the public. I really do want... To, I would love to know who actually did that, because... On the one hand, Starmer obviously wants to keep in touch with the public. I think his general feeling is that the public don't support the strikes. Um, but then, on, on the other hand it does make him look a bit ideologically watery. So people will be like, what is really the difference between you and Boris Johnson? And many people think he's... Starmer's just the worst alternative. Mm -hmm. Well, what did you think to Labour's response to that? Did you see it? It's in terms of the front benches not being allowed on the picket lines. Some of them, by the way, are not listening and doing it anyway. Uh, what's your thoughts on that? Get in touch and let me know. But for now, I shall move on. Uh, have you got a criminal record? Are you at home? Uh, tell me, if you did, was it something you had when you were a child, in your youth? And if so, how much do you think that that should affect you now going into your adulthood, particularly when it comes to things like getting a new job, changing jobs, whatever? Uh, because apparently thousands of people, uh, when they're having their criminal records checked, are having their spent convictions from their youth coming up on these DBS checks and having their prospects uh, somewhat hindered as a result. I do have to say, though, there were supposed to be new rules around this, which basically would stop some of these things happening, but it seems that the new rules haven't really uh, been followed. Now, of course, uh, there are some limits to this. I mean, if you're a mass murderer and you did that when you're 19, then unfortunately for you, that is going to affect you going forward. But if it's like a smaller kind of crime, you spend your conviction, then you should be able to move on, shouldn't you, James? Well, whatever happened to Christian forgiveness? You know, I'm, I'm no Christian, but I thought the purpose of uh, prison was, in part at least, rehabilitation. And, you know, if you read... I, generally, when, when the press says, you know, campaign is this, campaign is that, I know they're all highly paid NGOs, uh, not really deserving... Um, everything that they are paid. But uh, I have to agree with the campaigners on this uh, occasion. I always was suspicious of CRB checks. And to learn that a third uh, of the childhood offences, uh, more than a third, uh, that people are being booked on uh, happened more than 40 years ago. I mean, I remember stealing sweets from my local sweet shop. And, uh, you know, I, I was hauled up in front of the shop owner and I felt terrible and so on. Uh, is Did that... you get a criminal record for that? Because that's uh, the difference. No, because I was nine, you know. But uh, the point is that once you've served your time, you're supposed to be forgiven, you know. Now, obviously, you know, this isn't wholly black and white. If you've got a mass murderer or Harold Shipman or people like that, obviously you've got to watch out. But uh, I can't really believe that the, uh, the Home Office or whoever it is who handles the CRBs or the DBSs, as they're now called, you know, are really going to be uh, even-handed about this. I think it's really retrogressive. Dominique? Yeah, I, w I would tend to agree. I think when it comes to low-level crimes, the aim should always be first to um, rehabilitate. That's not to say that we shouldn't be tough on crime, but it's to say that for people that can be rehabilitated into society, I think there should be efforts for them to be rehabilitated. My issue is I think that our current justice system is has a bit of a broad brush um, 
approach. I think that, say, sex offenders, for example, particularly those that abuse children, um, rapists, I feel like a lot of the time they're actually given the same sort of sentences as someone who, who's done a, a bit of petty theft. And then when you actually um, look and, and, and they're to find a job, when you initially do the DBS check, you can't actually see um, if that person is on the sex offenders register. And especially for crimes involving children, I think even for the um, quick DBS checks, the first thing you should see is if someone is on the sex offenders register. Not if they've flipping, you know, done something like rob something without actually hurting anyone. And I think that is the real weirdness of it. And even here, I have an example. Um, this one guy is over 18, but this paedophile from Staffordshire, and this is in February, he was given an 18 month suspended sentence <laughs> for inappropriately touching a 12 year old girl, and he's 52. <laughs> suspended sentence. There was another one in 2011. Um, a teenager who was 16 at the time um, sexually abused a girl under 10 years old at the time, and he was also given a suspended sentence. So when it says in here minor crimes such as suspended sentences, sometimes it's not always so minor. And I think we should have a two tier system one where low level criminals are treated with compassion sometimes, and another where the really depraved, sick people are punished. Mm. Fair just, just to point out, by the way, um, that the whole kind of vetting system, it was toughened after, and I can't believe I'm about to say this date because I can't believe it's so long ago, but 2002, uh, the Soham murders. Do you remember that? Ian Huntley, of course. Mm. Um, yeah, I will never forget that crime. I Those are the believe. kind of people I'm talking about. Yeah, I though. can't believe that was in 2002, by the way. You will remember that he got the job, didn't you? Um, as the school caretaker I was, I'm referring, of course, to the murders. Uh, of Holly Wells and Jessica Chapman. Do you remember that? The two little girls. The image that stands in my mind about that is um, they, they had their little, was it Man United shirts on, if yeah. I remember rightly? Anyway, the point was, Ian Huntley, he'd been reported to the police on six occasions over sexual assaults on an underage girls and then was cleared to go and work at that school. So that's why I think systems, the system was tightened back after that. But even Yeah, of course, it was right. The system was tightened. I think invariably with these things, the pendulum swings one way and then we start to figure out, OK, maybe there's some issues there because certainly you'd want the net tight enough that someone like Ian Huntley was not going mm. to get through. And now we're looking to actually it's catching some people that shouldn't catch. So I think there's like a broad agreement here that actually non-violent offenders, especially when it's 40 years ago, shouldn't be stopped from having alternative economic opportunities and of course why is one of the people one of the reasons people do commit crimes like theft actually is also a lack of economic opportunity so certainly there is a role there to rehabilitate and reform people but you said non-violent by mm. the way so what about if someone i don't know you're 50 now and when you were 19 you got involved in a fight in a pub and you got charged you say non-violent should basically be kind of forgotten but what about if you had a violent conviction like that? You know, you're 19 and all the rest of it. Mm. You wouldn't want to carry that forward anyway, would you? I suppose that'd have to be a question for like a judge in the same way as it's for a parole board. You know, a parole board sits there and says when who should or shouldn't be released from prison. I think you'd end up with having the same kind of system, right? Unless you can see and hear and speak to this person. I I'm not really sure exactly what would happen in that case. I was thinking like someone like Timpsons, for example, do do great work. Oh, I love Timpsons. So fantastic. I've got a huge soft spot uh, for Timpsons. If you don't know what we're talking about, Timpsons is like um, like the cobblers, um, those kind of things. They pop up everywhere, actually. They have a great scheme um, where they do actually uh, employ a lot of ex-offenders. They go into the prisons as well, and they do a lot of recruitment there. I've got a lot of respect, actually, for that brand. Uh, and by the way, um, lots of convictions, they're supposed to be spent uh, and essentially not... Uh, on your record or not count after that point. But what's happening here, these campaigners are saying, is that that's not always um, the case. Let me know your thoughts on this. Do you think, by the way, just a standard an employer should ask you about a criminal record as part of the application process for any job? Do you think that's a fair question um, to ask? Now, I've got a really good email before I go to the break. I just want to read this out because I've asked you for your thoughts on these strikes. Apologies for bringing it back to that. But, Keith, uh, you've written in and said, you are extremely angry about the strikes today, angry in capital letters. I don't blame you, actually, because he goes on to say um, he is a respiratory surgeon who has had to cancel, get this, ladies and gentlemen, six operations today uh, because of these strikes. He says that two of those operations are life-threatening. Hmm. 
I mean, that's yeah. just not a good... That's made me go quite goose pimply, actually, because I just feel so sorry for the families uh, and, of course, the people that need these operations. Many of you, perhaps, if you had medical operations, you might have had disruption as well. Tell me your thoughts on all of that. Does it... Do the strikes... Do you know? Do you feel emotional about these or do you think that, actually, this is absolutely right and the people deserve fair pay? Let me know your thoughts. Get in touch, gbviews at gbnews.uk. Going to take a quick break. Uh, when we come back, I'll have your reaction to that last story we've just been doing. But also, you might have noticed the Hollywood star Ben Stiller. He's been over in Ukraine meeting President Zelensky, amongst other things. How effective are celebrities when it comes to raising awareness like this in a crisis? And is it necessary? Plus, I also want to ask you very briefly, what is your kind of method when it comes to finding love? Do you use apps? Are you already happy? What about love letters? Are they making a comeback? I'll tell you why I'm asking about that in just a couple of minutes. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV, on radio, on digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices. With honest and civilised conversation. We're not part of the establishment. We're one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> Whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. Join us for Ministry of Offence, the comedy panel show that's just like the news, and that the left fights the right, and it doesn't really seem to matter who wins. We cover the big stories. It was, in fact, a troop of baboons and not angry vegans. I like that. And the really important stories. Fat naked cow gets stuck in swimming pool. It's a headline in a lot of local newspapers. Yeah. <laughs> We're on the same team, Nick. Yeah, but I'm just helping you. Join us for Ministry of Offence, Saturday nights, 8 o'clock on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV, where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you, no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello there, welcome back to Jubes & Co with me, Michelle Jubery. Uh, keeping me company, a quick reminder, writer and broadcaster Dominique Samuels, the economist Jeevan Sander and Professor James Woodhouse. And if you've only just joined us, you've missed so far us talking about the strikes and criminal records and how much they should affect your future job prospects. In a second, we'll be talking about celebrities visiting war zones. Uh, is that the thing to do? Is it help or a hindrance? And also a little bit about love letters. Uh, joining me now, N Nigel Farage. Good evening to you. What have you got coming up at 7 o'clock, Nigel? Well, Michelle, as you say, day one of the strikes, the country, I think, coping remarkably well. Uh, the Conservative Party quite united on the fact we shouldn't give in to the unions. And yet the Labour Party, despite Keir Starmer threatening people with disciplinary action, up and down the country, Labour MPs and some senior ones joining picket lines. Now, of course, I know some of those MPs are funded directly by the RMT. But looking at this and the severity of the situation we could face over the next few months, I'll be debating... Is the Labour Party today a credible opposition? <laughs> ah, nice that's, one. I got a, um, a laugh from one of my panel members there. <laughs> you might have heard it yourself from where you are, Nigel. Look forward to that. We'll see you <laughs> at seven. Thank you. Uh, you do make me smile, James. I think, is your answer to that question no? When he says, is, is the Labour a credible opposition in your mind, or yes? Well, I said on your programme six months ago, uh, Michelle, that Keir Starmer is toast, and I still um, believe in that culinary judgment. 
Mm. Not even after his Love Island jokes at PMQ. Especially Star, after. Was it Star Trek as well, that one? <laughs> yeah. <What? laughs> you know, honestly, I, I do actually feel a little bit sorry for us at the moment because I do think the calibre of politicians... Mm. And I, I'm making this a broad brush, by the way. I'm not, partic uh, I'm not uh, picking on any one particular person, but I do think the calibre of politicians, the people that lead us, the people that we've got to choose uh, between... I think it's a little bit poor, actually, and I do believe that we deserve better right across the board. I also get incredibly tired of these monumental issues that affect so many people's lives, and the focus is on the politicking and the different parties trying to get the best outcomes for them, themselves, as opposed to the individuals that matter. And actually, I think we all become victims of this politicking, and quite frankly, I'm fed up of it, and I think it is all utterly wrong. Anyway, I get that off my chest. Right, uh, moving on, the American actor Ben Stiller. Uh, he's been basically in Ukraine. He says that President uh, Zelensky is his hero. Uh, when he's met him, he's been meeting with refugees as well in Poland and Ukraine. Uh, it's all part of his role as the ambassador for the United Nations Refugee Agency. Um, I'll cut to the chase here, Dominique. Celebrities going to war zones, crises, etc. Is it a help or is it a hindrance? Look, I'm not going to pretend I don't know why this is happening. Um, obviously, with celebrities, they're more visible, more people know who they are, especially the younger generations. I mean, Ben, Zilla's, ben Stiller's been in things like Meet the Fockers, <laughs> Zoolander, um, Night at the Museum. You know, everyone knows who Ben Stiller is. But at the same time, with this particular war, I'm afraid... I just, there's just something peculiar about it. You've got a host of celebrities parading Zelensky around. You've got him, you know, on the, on the front page of Time magazine. You've got him presenting Grammys. You've got people wanting him to make an appearance at the Oscars in the middle of what's supposed to be a really <laughs> devastating and damaging war. And I feel as though, whether it's a sign of the times post-COVID, that these serious issues are sort of integrated into our very culture. So we've got the blinders on and we can't take a step back and actually ask some really important questions, such as, is Zelensky doing everything he can in the best interests of his people and not his own profile? And are we being informed enough about the consequences of our current trajectory with Russia and whether or not our current trajectory is actually working? And it's things like that, the photo ops, the shiny photos that I've allow got a little people video, to be... actually. Yeah. <laughs> I'll play it. Let me just play you a little uh, video of the meeting that I've just referenced. I think we've got a short clip. Oh, OK. No? Um, I was supposed to come to it a bit early, but I was so excited to talk to my panel about their views uh, that I forgot to go to it. I'll be honest about that. So we're just going <laughs> to get it back up. But Oh, we've got it. There you go, modern technology. Great honour for me, and nice to see you. Um, it's really wonderful. You're my hero. Yes. Oh, yes. No. As as uh, you quit a great acting career for this, not so great as you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but pretty great. Um, hmm. James, your thoughts? Well, I, I don't think the problem is Zelensky. I'm right behind him, and I'm right behind uh, Ukraine. Although I don't want Russia dismembered, uh, you know, in the way that um, Lloyd Austin, the U.S. Secretary of Defense. Uh, wants to do. I think... I don't know Ben Stiller. I'm one of the people who doesn't know him, although I may have yeah. caught a second of Meet the Fockers. Uh, but one of the great things about your show, Michelle, um, is that you never discuss celebrities. And I think uh, maybe we should start doing that because I hate them. I hate what they've done to politics. I hate... You uh, don't hate all celebrities. No, I do. I hate the phenomenon of celebrity, right? And the, the belief that a celebrity can raise awareness with a little lapel or a little, uh, you know, bracelet about any issue, whether it's AIDS or Ukraine. We've got wall-to-wall -wall Ukraine. Young people even may have heard of the Ukraine situation. They don't need their awareness raised. They need their consciousness raised so that we arrive at the right policy to support the Ukrainians and to expel Putin and his troops from Ukraine. They need consciousness and action and real solidarity gestures. The Nobel what's... Prize winner who gave $103 million for his Nobel Prize just yesterday to the cause of Ukraine, that is really uh, a solidarity. That is not just wearing your heart on your sleeve. That's the real deal, and that's what the Ukrainians need. Um, 
Mm. Yeah, I mean, that's not necessarily my point. Whilst I agree that, you know, little tokenistic gestures won't really do much, people's consciousness has already been raised to a place where you've got people that clearly don't have a clue about the realities of war calling for NATO to storm in there and effectively <laughs> calls, cause World War Three. You've got people screaming sanctions, sanctions, sanctions. Meanwhile, Russia's profits are overflowing and they're, um, one of, they're China's greatest oil provider now, something that American generals actually predicted before this war even began. So this was expected. So. Are the sanctions working? Is Zelensky doing everything in the interest of his people and not, not himself? And are Hollywood actors like Ben Stiller going to marvel over Zelensky a bit of a distraction tactic? I, I think it is. Let me uh, take those in turn, if I may. On the sanctions, they are absolutely working. Russia's economy is in crisis. We've seen inflation peak. Revenues are falling and imports especially are falling. Very difficult for them to get components since for the their own began, since the war has began. Since the war has began. They've enjoyed GDP, the highest GDP, 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 no, they haven't. They have. uh, no, they have not. GDP, I've heard that more. I've, heard, I've seen that. I've read that more than once. That's nice. GDP has fallen <laughs> by 15% this year. Oil and gas revenues are rising, but of course, revenues in the rest of the economy are falling and at this point in time. China's and the next point of this, yes, it's also true that Russia is now supplying oil to the rest of the world, but Russia also has China. to sell that oil. America's biggest Russia competitor. also has to sell oil at a discount to those supplies, simply because people don't want to deal with the Russian government that means they can just when sell they knew more. that secondary sanctions to apply to them. On the second point of how Zelensky has done as a leader during this war, but, we should not uh, forget. Not, we should not, not address forget. The you've not addressed, we should not you've forget not addressed the, first, the first. You've not addressed the first part. I thought right? it was about still on this was slot. Was yeah, I mean, if I may, Zelensky. No, can, can I just come back? Can I just come back? No, I'm going to come forward. Uh, Zelensky. Uh, no, I'm <laughs> just going to come right back. That was Zelensky. a nice. That was a nice Zelensky. attempt. Oh, I don't no, appreciate okay. being patronised like that. That okay. was a nice attempt, Dominic, but you haven't actually addressed anything I've said. Because people at home can't hear a word of what's going on, so you can't talk over each other. So, right, Jeevan, make your point and then let Dominique respond. Of course. So on the Zelensky, the war leader bit, we should remember that when Zelensky was offered at the beginning, when it looked like Kiev was about to fall, when he was offered a ride out, he said, no, I will stay here and I will ensure that Ukraine will survive. When this war began, the initial formulation was said that Ukraine and Kiev would fall within a week. We're here now 90 days, 100 days. Ukraine has not fallen. Yeah. He stayed behind. And in terms of him drawing attention to this, we also have war fatigue. That's the reason why he does keep doing these kind of things, I think, so that people in publics across the country, across the globe, rather, still support the fate and the people of Ukraine, that we don't get bored and forget it and okay, see it all up so, our front pages. OK, so, A, in terms of sanctions, Boris, Biden, they've already admitted that this is going to have to be a long game, which means in order for these sanctions to be effective, they will have to go on, not for months, but for potentially more than a year. So to say that these sanctions are doing extremely well, I think is a bit of a falsehood because Russia has been living under sanctions for probably about 14 years. Yes, the sanctions have been ramped up, probably about eight years actually. Yes, the sanctions have been increased, but they already planned for sanctions. Hence why they've been able to sell oil to massive powers, direct competitor with America, by the way, like China, at a discount, which means in the long term, that puts the American um, global strategy at a disadvantage because you're basically paying China still to overtake you. We've got about 30 seconds B, left on the programme. Sorry, sorry, uh, sorry. Um, B, Russia is using a fraction of its, of its military force, and that's with... NATO supplying weapons to Ukrainian you, army. That's why they're slowly you? losing. C, yes, he's doing things to remain visible because of war fatigue, but also because he knows damn and fine well that NATO will not dedicate troops to the ground, which will cause World War III, right. and that's what he wants. Well, Ega, I think she's got D, E and F, but they'll have to have this out after the show because that is all we've got time for. I didn't even have time to talk to you about love letters. I'll have to have that one uh, tomorrow. If you uh, write love letters, tell me, and I'll discuss it. Tomorrow, have yourself a wonderful night. Thanks to my panel and thanks for your company at home. Hello again. Clear skies overnight for many will lead to a sunny Wednesday and even warmer conditions, especially across southern and eastern parts of the UK. High pressure keeping things fine for most at the moment. A large area of high pressure in the Atlantic blocking significant rain and wind from coming our way. 
And as a result, for the vast majority, it is going to be clear night. Even though we've seen some cloud for northern England, central and eastern Scotland through the day, clear spells developing here. The one area I think where we'll keep the thicker cloud and some low cloud will be the far northwest of Scotland with uh, some outbreaks of light rain and drizzle. But clear spells elsewhere and temperatures holding up despite those clear spells in places 13 or 14 Celsius by dawn. So a bright start for many and certainly looking like a sunnier day for northern England and eastern Scotland compared with Tuesday. Even northern Ireland where we start with some cloud will brighten up with some sunshine coming through in places. But we keep the low cloud and the breeze and the cooler conditions in the far northwest of Scotland. Elsewhere with the sunshine and light winds temperatures respond well. Mid 20s for eastern Scotland, high 20s for eastern parts of England. Into Wednesday evening and clear spells for most once again and light winds as well. One or two mist and fog patches are possible, but for the vast majority it's another mild or even warm night. In fact, temperatures in, say, Cardiff and London won't drop below 15 or 16 Celsius, 13 for Glasgow and for Belfast. In Northern Ireland, Western Scotland again will start off with a lot of cloud, perhaps a few spots of rain and drizzle. But for the vast majority elsewhere, it's a sunny start. We need to watch some showers or thunderstorms moving up from the channel to affect southern parts of the UK by the afternoon. But further north, it's another very warm and sunny day with temperatures reaching the mid to high 20s. Much cooler weather on Friday in the weekend with some showers. We are GB News. We're right across.